Welcome to Back Creek Church's online worship service. Here at Back Creek, we believe that God has called us to be about connecting people with the hope of the gospel. Over the past several months, it has been quite a challenge to be able to connect with people, to be able to connect with you, and to be able to connect with one another. So we have had to learn new and different ways of being able to do that. We have also had to learn different ways of being able to worship God and do that in the best way that we have been able while being able to keep you safe. Thankfully, a few weeks ago, in addition to our online services, we were able to begin meeting on campus in the form of a drive-in service. Next Sunday, August 2nd at 9 a.m., we get to take another step to move towards a more normal worshiping service. So next week, we will set up closer to the railroad tracks on the side of our Family Life Center. With this move, we can welcome families to get out of their cars and to be able to bring their own chairs and to engage with one another a little bit better and still be able to, to participate in the service. You will also be able to sit out in the shade where it might be a little bit cooler. There will also be the option to be able to stay in your car if you feel more comfortable and safe that way. We would like to remind everyone to bring their own water and to stay hydrated because it continues to be very hot as we are worshiping. But this gathering will allow us to have a bit more of a connection, a connection with one another, and it is one step closer to being able to worship, to worship God together in a more normal way. We also have this Sunday virtual vacation Bible school starting Sunday night, July 26th. It starts at 6 p.m. The lessons will be released on Google Classroom. That's, that's at 6. And there is a live Google Hangout every evening at 6 p.m. from Sunday to Wednesday. And if you need more information about this or if you need a detective kit for your child, please contact Ms. Kelly. As we, as we enter into this time of worship, please join me in prayer. Father, we thank you that you have brought us together in this unusual way, but we thank you for the ways that you have provided for us to be able to continue to worship you. As we enter into this time of worship, Lord, and as we enter into the studying of your word, we pray that you will, by your spirit, that you will help us to pay attention, that you will help us to uh, focus on you with our hearts and our minds, Lord, and that you will continually remind us that you are God and that we are your people. Lord, help us to worship you in spirit and in truth. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
the sinless Savior died My sinful soul is counted free For God the justice that is by To look on Him and pardon me Look on Him and pardon me afternoon or evening uh, whenever you decided to tune in to worship with us. Pray with me, please. Father, we're thankful for another opportunity we have to worship as your church. We ask that you would forgive us for the times we've taken for granted being able to meet together to sing, listen to your word and pray. We pray, Lord, that when we're able to join together again, we, we do so with a renewed joy and appreciation. God, we thank you for sustaining us personally and as a church during these last several months. We're grateful for our health, livelihoods, and the necessities of life you provide. Lord, as we press forward in these trying times, help us to continue to be examples of the hope and assurance that you offer. We pray that you would grant healing and comfort to those of us who are sick, and we give thanks that several of our church family are on the mend after re recent il illnesses. God, we ask that you would comfort the folks who have recently lost family members, provide the support that only you can. We ask, Father, that you would grant wisdom to our local, state, and national leaders, as well as health experts as we look to end this pandemic. Protect those people who put themselves in harm's way to protect and provide for us. Lord, rid our minds of all the clutter of the weak, and enable us to be renewed by the message you've given Matt for today. Equip us for a new week and a stronger desire to be Christ-like in all we do and say. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. This morning we are continuing our series on Malachi entitled The Wait. And we are talking about how we are waiting on a timelessly good God. And we continue this series looking at the second part of chapter 1 and going through chapter 2. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Father, as we enter into your word, as we uh, seek to study and to understand who you are, we pray that you will speak to our hearts and our minds this morning. Lord, we pray that you will help us to understand who you are, that you will help us to repent of our own sinfulness and our own struggles, Lord, and be able to worship you more fully. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. In today's culture, truth is losing its meaning. What is more important to many of us is not what is true, but it is what is real. Is what you are saying real? Are you real? Another way of saying this is, is are you being consistent with what you are saying? Or 
are you consistent? Are you always consistent with what you believe? Today, as we look at the end of Malachi 1 and the beginning of Malachi 2, we answer what does it mean to be a real or authentic Christian? Are you and I being consistent with our beliefs? So let us look together at Malachi, starting with Malachi 1.6, going through 2.16. I ask you to please bear with me as this is a very long passage. A son honors his father, and a servant his master. If then I am a father, where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is my fear? Says the Lord of hosts to you. O priest who despise my name. But you say, how have we despised your name? By offering polluted food upon my altar. But you say, how have we polluted you? By saying that the Lord's table may be, be despised. When you offer blind animals in sacrifice, is that not evil? And when you, when you offer those that are lame or sick, is that not evil? Present that to your governor. Will he accept you or show you favor, says the Lord of hosts? And now entreat the favor of God that he may be gracious to us. With such a gift from your hand, will he show favor to any of you, says the Lord of hosts? Oh, that there were one among you who would shut the doors, that you might not kindle fire on my altar in vain. I have no pleasure in you, says the Lord of hosts, and I will not accept an offering from the nations. And in every place, incense will be offered to my name and a pure offering. For my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. But you profane it when you say that the Lord's table is polluted and its fruits, that is, its food may be despised. But you say, what a weariness this is. And you snort at it, says the Lord of hosts. You bring what, what has been taken by violence or is lame or is sick. And this you bring as an offering. Shall I accept that from your hand, says the Lord? Cursed be the cheat who has a male in his flock and vows it and yet sacrifices to the Lord what is blemished. For I am a great king, says the Lord of hosts, and my name will be feared among the nations. And now, O priest, this command is for you. If you will not listen, if you will not take it to heart to give honor in my name, says the Lord of hosts, then I will send the curse upon you, and I will curse your blessings. Indeed, I have already cursed them, because you do not lay it to heart. Behold, I will rebuke your offspring and spring dung on your faces, the dung of your offerings, and you shall be taken away with it. So you shall know that I have sent this command to you, that my covenant with Levi may stand, says the Lord of hosts. My covenant with him was one of life and peace, and I gave them to him. It was a covenant of fear, and he feared me. He stood in awe of my name. True instruction was in his mouth, and no wrong was found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and uprightness, and he turned many from iniquity, for the lips of a priest should guard knowledge, and people should seek instruction from his mouth. For he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts, but you have turned aside from the way. You have caused many to stumble by your instruction, and you have corrupted the covenant of Levi, says the Lord of hosts. And so I make you despised and abased before all the people. And as much as you do not keep my ways, but show partiality in your instruction. Have we not all one father? Has not, not one God created us? Why then are we faithless to one another? Pro profaning the covenant of our fathers... Judah has been faithless, and abomination has been committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. For Judah has profaned the sanctuary of the Lord, which he loves, and has married the daughter of a foreign god. 
May the Lord cut off from the tents of Jacob any descendants of the man who does this, who brings an offering to the Lord of hosts. And the second thing you do, you cover the Lord's altar with tears, with weeping and groaning, because no longer regards the offering or accept it with favor from your hand. But you say, why does he not? Because the Lord with witness between you and the wife of your youth, to whom you have been faithless, though she is your companion and your wife by covenant, did he not make them one with a portion of the Spirit in their union? And what was the one God seeking? Godly offspring? So guard yourselves in your spirit, and let none of you be faithless to the wife of your youth. For the man who does not love his wife, but divorces her, says the Lord, the God of Israel covers his garment with violence, says the Lord of hosts. So guard yourselves in your spirit and do not be faithless. Last week we learned that the Old Testament people of God were a lot, a lot like us. They were a stubborn bunch that after God's continual love and his faithfulness to them, that they were questioning whether God even really loved them. This week, this week we will see that because of their questioning that God's people, they struggle to honor God and they struggle to give him real worship. They, in appearance, are doing the things that God has asked them to do, but it's not real. It's not authentic. So today, as we are moving through, when we talk about real... We are meaning, are we consistent with ourselves? Are we doing what God has called us to do? However, to be honest, we all continually struggle with this. We struggle with it every day to be able to live as we are called. So today we will see God's calling for your pastors is to be real pastors. And for your families is to be real in your relationships and all of us are to be in general real Christians but the only way that we are able to do this the only way that we are able able to be real to be authentic is by the power of the Holy Spirit so as God calls Israel to repent of these struggles he also calls us repent seek God and continually ask the Holy Spirit to help because it is only by his power that we are able to live. And by God's grace, his love continues for us as we struggle to be faithful to him. So first, we look at real pastors and real church leaders. The Lord begins by dealing with the Old Testament priests. It is wise and prudent when we are calling for repentance. And we are talking about discipleship to begin with a church's leadership. And whenever Pastor Carr or I, whenever we preach a sermon, we first study it and we pray. And we pray that God would deal with us, speak to our own hearts, and help us to confess and to repent of anything that we are struggling with, but especially things that we are struggling with that the passage deals with. Lest we don't speak as hypocrites, although honestly, we sometimes fail. Walter Kaiser says in his commentary that this passage is a divine call for authenticity, an authenticity that exceeds all current fashions, slogans, or eddies of our day. He points out that there is sometimes a credibility gap or an authenticity gap especially for the clergy. And when there is a problem with the pastors, there is often a problem with the congregation. He says, For as go the clergy, so goes the people. God asks his priests a couple of questions at the very beginning in chapter 1, verse 6. He says, If I am a father, then where is my honor. 
And if I am a master, where is my fear? Here the problem is that the priests are allowing people to bring whatever kind of offering they want to worship the Lord. But God has commanded the best, the first fruits. And it is the priest's duty then to carry out the law and expect, expect the people to bring their best. But the problem here lies primarily with the priest. It is their job to turn away the people for bringing the wrong offerings. It is their job to hold the people accountable to worship God in a good and right way. However, they are failing. They are taking the easy way out by letting people bring whatever they want as acceptable gifts. They are failing to give the hard truths to their people. The problem with the clergy is that they are serving God half-heartedly. Kaiser again says it was sheer indifference, carelessness, and half-heartedness, primarily on the part of the leadership. And then among the people at large that blocked the full effects of the people's privileged position and election from showing through in God's love. Today our problem may not lie in the failure to demand a proper offering. God has called us to faithfully preach the importance of giving out of our blessing, the blessing which he has poured out upon us. However, the primary issue among the clergy of us pastors is us serving half-heartedly, serving with indifference. As pastors, as elders, deacons, and staff, we often fail to serve God and to serve you with our whole hearts. We grow tired, we grow weary, and we falter. Other times we have this tendency to try to do everything on our own, try to do it without God's power, and thus we fail to honor God by recognizing our own weaknesses and him, giving him the honor and glory that he is due. So this part of the sermon isn't directed towards you, it's directed to me. And it's directed to our leadership. However, when we struggle, sometimes then that will trickle down to you all. It'll trickle down to other people within the church. Therefore, it is my responsibility to be transparent to be open, to be authentic, and to confess before you my failures. Because this passage is calling me, and later it's calling us to repent and to remember his faithfulness, the faithfulness of our God and, and his love for us. Today I confess to you, I confess to you that during this pandemic it has been hard for me to be faithful. It has been hard for me to be faithful in my devotional life, and it has been hard for me to be faithful to my people, to be able to reach out to them, to be able to minister to them, and to be able to connect with them. And today I ask for your forgiveness, and I ask that you pray for me, and that we pray together, and that we learn, and that we grow together. Secondly, God is calling the people of God to real marriages, to a, a real family life, to real authentic families. We are talking here not about just our marriages and just our families, but we are talking about our church family as a whole. In chapter 2, verses 10 through 16, God calls out his people for their faithlessness to one another. According to Professor John Mackey, the primary blame here still falls on the church leadership. He says, when the religious leaders of the people fall short of what is required of them, a general moral decline takes place. The moral decline he is referring to is an unfaithfulness in relationships. 
And this is most evident in marriages. However, there is something that begins with a general problems in all relationships. Verse 10 begins, Have we all not one father? Then why have we been faithless to one another? The people as a whole have been called to help each other in their faith, to love one another, and to be committed to one another. Israel was to meditate on the law day and night, to, to talk about it on walks, to write it on their foreheads, so that they would be continually reminded of who they are, of who God is, and how they are in a relationship with him. Because of this, the people are to be accountable to one another. They are to help one another. But they not only have to be faithful to God, they are supposed to be faithful to one another. But they continue in this faithful, faithlessness. In a similar way, God calls us to be authentic and faithful to one another. We are one family as Christians. And therefore we are called to this discipleship kind of relationship. Faithfulness to each other means that we are called, that we call each other out on sins and struggles. But it also means that we are committing to loving each other and to encouraging one another in the faith. We are to remind each other of who God is and who we are because of his good love. But again, the problem here becomes most evident in marriages. Our unfaithfulness to God brings unfaithfulness to each other, which ends up with husbands and wives struggling to love each other well. Sometimes this leads to adultery. Other times it leads to divorce. But this we see is a result of problems already going on. It isn't at the core. Verses 13 through 16 say this. And this second thing you do. You cover their Lord's altar with tears. With weeping and groaning because he no longer regards the offering or accepts it with favor from your hand. But you say, why does he not? Because the Lord was witness between you and the wife of your youth, to whom you have been faithless. Though she is your companion and your wife by covenant. Did he not make them one with a portion of the Spirit in their union? And what was the one God seeking? Godly offspring. So guard yourselves in your spirit and let none of you be faithless to the wife of your youth. For the man who does not love his wife but divorces her, says the Lord, the God of Israel, covers his garment with violence, says the Lord of hosts. So guard yourselves in your spirit and do not be faithless. Here we see that faithlessness and divorce result from the problems of unfaithfulness to God and unfaithfulness to others. Therefore, God, he does not accept the offerings, but rather they are to repent and they are to never forget the wife of their youth. Today, we are in a unique Time. This time of COVID has been a challenge on our relationships on at least two fronts. First, with our church family relationships. It is hard for us to be faithful to one another because we have to do things that, that we really don't like. Things like picking up the phone and calling someone or getting on a, a Zoom call and, and talking to each other in awkward ways or maybe writing letters or sending cards, it makes our communication much more difficult. 
Secondly, many of us have been with our families a lot. We have been at home and we are with them all of the time. And sometimes we grow weary of one another. And then that begins to affect our relationships and the tension grows and we have a really hard time getting along. God calls us here to repent. Not in just the big things, but also in some of these small things. We repent and we turn back. He says, don't be faithless. And by not being faithless, he doesn't just mean don't commit adultery, but he means that we need to actively love our husband or our wife or our children. We need to actively love the other church members. We must seek to be faithful to God first and then seek to be faithful to one another. One way we can do this today is by not forgetting the wife of our youth. And I mean that in all of our relationships, we remind ourselves and we try to remember all of the good things about that person, all the good things that are in that relationship and why we first love that person. Finally, God calls us to be real, as in real, authentic Christians. I want to remind us all that by real, this means that we are to live as God has called us to. However, we fail often. This last section brings us to this, this idea of offerings. The offerings which we give to the Lord. First, we notice that if we are being unfaithful in our relationships, then the offerings are not acceptable. Secondly, if we are worshiping God half-heartedly, if we are pretending or just trying to get by, then again, our sacrifices are unacceptable. Here, the problem lies primarily with the clergy. And this continues on with a failure among relationships and then finally leads to this half-hearted half worship of the people. The people brought to God offerings that were polluted foods or blind animals. What they offered was not their best. Why? Because the people had grown indifferent. They just didn't really care. And they didn't really believe anymore that their God loved them. Today this relates with our offerings of all sorts to God. It relates to our tithing, but it also relates to our giving of our time and our talents. How do we worship God in a way that is holy and acceptable? First, we are unable to offer true worship without the help of the Holy Spirit. Our lives, to be quite honest, are, are a bunch of filthy rags of sin. We have nothing good to offer except for because of Jesus and his righteousness and the power of the Holy Spirit. Second, we ask God to help us to give of everything that we have. So we give back financially because we know that he will provide. We give of our time by regularly, regularly reading his word or praying for ourselves, praying for our families, praying for our church. And we also give of our time by serving in areas where there is need in our church, in our families, in our communities. And finally, we give of our talents. And this means that that whatever kinds of gifts that God has given you, whatever kind of talents, talents that you have, that we must share them. Share them again with our church. Share them with our families and share them with our communities. Finally, this morning, we must wait. We must continue to wait 
as God is still making us who we will be. Today we are reminded that we are in this waiting period as, as God patiently waits for his people to repent, to be faithful, and to live as they are called. We remember from last week that where this book lies, it is just before they enter into this 400 years of silence. This 400 years of waiting where they're looking for the coming Messiah, the Savior, their King that would finally bring restoration. And today we are in a similar kind of waiting as God is still calling for his people's repentance. Chapter 4 says, Remember the law of my servant Moses, the statutes and rules that I commanded him at Horeb for all Israel. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. Today we are called to remember. We are called to confess our shortcomings, our failures and our struggles, and worship God faithfully. As pastors, as your church leadership, God has called us to repent and be real pastors. As families, we are called to repent and remember and be real families, honest and authentic to one another. And as Christians, again, God has called us to be real Christians, loving one another well, encouraging each other and holding each other accountable. But we continue to wait on Jesus to return so that we may see our timelessly good God and his faithfulness. Let us pray. God, we thank you for your word. Lord, we confess before you that we are utter sinners. Lord, we are continually running away from you. We are continually becoming indifferent. And Lord, we pray that you will help us to repent of our ways. Lord, to turn back to you and remember that you are an awesome God. Lord, that you are continually faithful and good to us. You are continually pouring out your love for us. But Lord, we so often, we fail to see that. We got caught up in our own ways and we fail to worship you. Lord, we pray for your forgiveness and we pray for your help. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
have been so, so good. Oh, with every breath that I am made, oh, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. Your goodness is running out, it's running out to me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I'm surrendered now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. In all my life, you have been faithful. so so good with every breath that I am made for oh, oh I will sing of the goodness of God in all my life you have been faithful in all my been so so good oh with every breath that i am made oh yeah i will see of the goodness of god oh i will see of the goodness Now hear the Lord's benediction. And may the grace of the Lord Jesus, the love of the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen.